Hello, everybody, and welcome to this month's episode of the Social Wave Project podcast. My name is Sarah Francis, but everyone calls me Sarah. And once a month, I interview guests talking about the things they love, as well as raising awareness. And in this month's episode, we are continuing our interviews for the Summer Reading Challenge 2021. And I am really nervous about this because this is a short intro I'm going to be doing before I interview today's guest. I'm a little bit nervous about this one because today I'm going to be interviewing I'm going to be interviewing one of my favourite authors of all time and I am a little bit nervous about this because this is something I have always wanted to do and yeah I, I will get a little bit jumpy towards the, uh, the continuation of the interview but hopefully I'll be okay but I think yeah I, I am a little bit nervous about this but hopefully fingers crossed we'll get there. Yay! If you would like to take part in the Summer Reading Challenge, it will go on until September. And all you have to do, if you want to participate or want to log in, you can actually join at www.thereadingagency.com forward slash Summer Reading Challenge or visit your local library for more information on how to participate. Right. OK, so it's recording. But yeah. OK. okay. Here we go. Okay, cool. So I am joined by the um, amazing Holly Smile. Holly, hello. Hi, so nice and to be here. Did I get your surname right, first of all? And uh, It's Mayo. So yeah, it's... <laughs> okay. I, I, I knew I was getting confused. <laughs> yeah, everyone does. It's Cornish, so yeah. I didn't know it was Cornish. Yeah, I believe so. My granddad's into all that kind of ancestry stuff, so I believe it's Cornish. Um, oh, yeah. oh, that's fantastic. <laughs> but, but I'm, I'm sorry I got your surname wrong. But, oh, uh, no, no, it's fine, it's fine. It's, you know, it's, I get it, everyone's name wrong. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so it's, it's just one of those things, really. But um, glad everything worked out. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, so um, normally I will probably leave uh, people to ask to talk about themselves. But Holly, um, who I know, uh, she is a author who has written um, many books in Series, including Geek Girl and I got a copy of it right here because it's very close to my heart and then also the Valentines but yeah so yeah Holly do you want to talk us more about yourself as well? Um, yeah uh, uh, so I am a, yeah, as you say British writer of uh, so far teen fiction. Um, uh, Geek Girl came out like eight years ago so it's been yeah nearly a decade um, and I am what else 39 live in Brighton um and i yeah uh, i i think i've been uh, talking more and more recently because uh about 8 months ago i was diagnosed with autistic which means that i'm on this new journey um to sort of discovering more and finding out more but also you know about uh, kind of being part of that community i guess so yeah that's kind of in a nutshell what i'm doing right now <laughs> well it, it's a massive big deal really because with a diagnosis process for autism it's it's always a long complicated journey especially since people have been diagnosed late and uh, I know a few people who've been diagnosed in their 30s so it, it's perfectly understandable if it's a new journey that's going through but Holly I have to say you are a main inspiration to the autism community like publishing books in the mainstream industry which is absolutely fantastic yeah thank you I mean it's been crazy because I'm not obviously nearly 40 years old so that's like that's quite late I mean obviously you can get autism diagnosis at any point in your life but that's four decades of, of not being diagnosed um and so you know it, it's crazy looking back because obviously I spent eight years writing Harriet Manners uh who um is someone messaged me yesterday saying she's probably the most autistic fictional character that I've ever read how did you not realize <laughs> and I'm like because I knew so little about it that you know I spent a decade writing this character who was based on me as a teenager um and every time anyone sort of said do you think she might be on the spectrum I'd be like no like she's just really clever but she also finds emotions overwhelming hides under tables puts everything into lists and categories uses facts to make sense of the world um yeah no she's just she's just you know clever um so it's bonkers it's bonkers that it took me decades to work it out <laughs> oh that was absolutely incredible because that was going to be one of the things I was going to ask as well because I was thinking about that a few days ago and it was 
really surprising because when I looked at Harriet, even though she wasn't described in the books as being on the autistic spectrum, she's very relatable to readers who are autistic because um, it, it, the, everyone thinks the traits are all there really. And um, it's, it's, it's really, um, it's mind blowing to think about yeah. it. <laughs> she is autistic. Like I'm now, I know. Now I've been diagnosed myself. Um, it's it's so very very clear. Um, and you know, it's it's it. What's what's kind of interesting about it is that obviously, you know, I wasn't sitting down and going right. What are autistic characteristics that I would be putting into my fictional character? I was just writing myself, and um, you know, therefore she she was me, um, which is is autistic. That's that's what I am, and that's what she is. So yeah, it's it's a really uh, strange pathway to realizing who you are but by you know via your fictional character well it's absolutely incredible really and um, it's still mind-blowing to think about that especially since you gave a recent interview in the times newspaper about your autism as well it, it yeah. kind of like the puzzles fit instantly yeah sorry one second someone's trying to ring me and i oh, oh my friend sorry she's <laughs> I had it on silent, but it went through my Alexa, which meant that it was just shouting. So I was trying to oh, oh, no, that's no problem, actually. My boyfriend was doing the same, really, when I was uh, panicking. And it was just like, darling, darling, I know I was doing too, but I'm in this meeting now. <laughs> I know, I did. The problem with working from home is that it can be really great because you don't actually have to go anywhere, which is also obviously awesome for, you know, people who might be wired in a certain way. But it does mean that you forget thing about things like Alexa shouting at you from the corner. Um, oh. Sorry. So where were? I think it was just as well, really. I, I know I probably will jump into the questions um, very soon, but so I know that me as a person, Harriet really means a lot to me, really. And I know it will probably go with the same as any, like not just autistic girls, but women and then boys as well, really. But I know that most readers for Geek Girl and the Valentines will be girls. Well, actually, yeah, I mean, generally, probably, yes. I mean, you know, they've looked at studies and, um, you know, boys are less likely to read people who are female authors, but also um, with the word girl in the title of the book, um, you know, whereas girls will tend to read anything, that's like statistically proven. Hence why it was JK Rowling and not Joanne Rowling, because they knew that if it was Joanne Rowling, they would sell less books. Um, but what's fascinating is that like we sold a lot, you know, it did, it did well, we sold three and a half million. Um, and, you know, which means means that three and a half million people at least given that you share books and libraries and all that kind of stuff have read Harriet and loved Harriet essentially or maybe they didn't but probably um maybe <laughs> um and obviously statistically they weren't all autistic like couldn't have been so you know for, I think for the people that are on the spectrum they were seeing themselves in a way that maybe they hadn't seen it before given it was coming out you know nearly 10 years ago um but also for people who aren't on the spectrum there are obviously things that they can identify with or social awkwardness or you know anxiety or you know it I think it kind of it, it's a really nice way of showing that actually, you know, there are things that we can all sort of take and relate to, um, regardless of where we are on, you know, being human. <laughs> oh, yes, I definitely couldn't agree more. And then I'm going to jump into the questions, really, because I know we, we got so much to talk about, really, in terms of like the books. And then um, and then also, um, as everyone knows, the summer is the summer reading challenge, which tries to encourage like children and teenagers to read as well, especially especially um, with an autistic audience, because um, autistic children and teenagers, I believe, aren't really getting enough support for the, the reading skills as well at school and at home as well. And it's always re very important to recognise this and encourage people as well. Yes, so important, you know, like it needs to be, um, I think generally they, they often aren't getting support in, on any level, but, you know, whether it's, whether it's reading, whether it's, you know, whether it's maths, whether it's sensory, whether it's, you know, quiet places to go, there, there is a lot of uh, work that needs to be done in terms of supporting autistic um, children. So yeah, I'm, I'm, I mean, I think the Summer Reading Challenge is such a fun thing. Like I'm personally a, a massive reader. So um, anything that, you know, encourages people to read, I'm, I'm happy about. <laughs> Oh, oh, yeah, it's, it's definitely brilliant, though, with everyone's just like getting into the Summer Read Challenge. And I know that I've been a volunteer doing the Summer Read Challenge at the library for three years. And it, it, yeah, it, it's just a wonderful experience to do that. But it was quite tense. And I found out that some of the children can be 
quite shy about telling the stories and they feel a bit tense about it as well. And it was really interesting to see that. And it, it was like trying to encourage. And then it, I remember that you have to ask, volunteers had to ask three questions uh, before the children get their stickers. And the children, they weren't really too sure by it really, because they were either shy and they felt like, I'm being pressured I don't know what to do please help me and I felt so sorry for the kids because I can imagine really it's just like homework sometimes for them rather than actually an enjoyment which yeah and it, the problem is the thing with books as well is that there's um there's a sense that you might get it wrong or that there's a right and a wrong answer that they might you know somehow either you know slip up on or they might you know they, they feel embarrassed that they could you know maybe reveal that they didn't know what the story was really about or whatever it is so I think there's like sometimes there's a barrier to reading that involves a lot of kind of kind of miss miss kind of information about what reading is it should just be fun there's no right and wrong answer you're not going to get things wrong when you're talking about a book oh yeah definitely I really couldn't agree more really and it, it's just like always it's always going to be the big thing really and then um the first question I've uh, like wrote because knowing that we've talked about books what is your favorite book uh, um of, that you've written and why because I know before we started the interview we were talking about um the first geek girl book again and um I have to wonder was it your favourite book to write or was the other book series or the Valentine's book series that were your favourites? Oh, it's such a tricky question because like, you know, I mean, people often refer to books as like their author's babies and it does genuinely feel like they're my children. Um, and, you know, I, I feel very differently. I love them all very differently. I, I have memories attached to, you know, maybe particularly difficult books that were particularly rewarding or emotional to write. Um, so I, I feel attached to them all in very different but equal ways, like a mum, essentially. Um, I think Gig Girl 1 was the book that changed my life. I mean, it literally, I went from being um, unemployed um, and living with my mum and dad um, to being a published best-selling author, um, which completely changed everything for me. Um, and, you know, I'm very lucky because I really only have one skill set. <laughs> I, I am very bad at everything else. Like, you know, I'm dyspraxic as well as as well as autistic, which means that, you know, physically it, everything can be quite tricky. Um, and it's, you know, I'm also have dyscalculia, so numbers, no, no use to me whatsoever. Um, so generally I my skill set is super spiky. Um and I'm very, very lucky that I managed to make a career out of uh, the one thing I was really, really good at. Um, but it, yeah, it changed everything. And I don't know what I'd be doing right now if I hadn't. So I'm very attached to the first Geek Girl book just partly because it changed everything. And also because it's where I met Harriet. And my relationship with Harriet is um, almost uh, almost magical, to be honest. Like, she's like my child. She's like the younger version of me. She's um, like this real person to me like I talk to her in my head um which I know sounds insane but <laughs> so that's really important um likewise her whole journey I love each of the books for you know different reasons for instance the third book was very very uh, easy and fun to write like I didn't have any issues with it at all um uh, the last book was highly emotional and I really enjoyed tying up her journey in a way that I had been because it was always supposed to be a standalone so a lot of the end of the first geek girl book um, was uh, pushed back when we realised it wasn't going to be a standalone, it was going to be a series. Um, so some of the ending of the last Giga book, so book six, was the end of the first book originally, um, which was really great because it meant that I spent nearly, de nearly a decade getting to the end of that book instead of writing it all at the same time. Wow. <laughs> yeah, which was... Uh, it meant, I mean, the, the joy in that and being able to tell a story over six books, it's amazing. Um, so yeah, and also the Valentines. I love like the three characters that I've written for the Valentine series. I love them all just as passionately as I love Harriet. Um, so yeah, can't really pick one. But in terms of the book that changed my life, it would be the first Geek Girl. I've always knew it was kind of like that, really, because I always find that it's more based on your life, really, because um, I know that you were a teen model as well. Yeah, I was. I was a terrible, terrible, terrible team model. <laughs> I was the worst model that's ever existed in the history of time. 
Um, uh, yes, it's essentially autobiographical, but in a, um, I, I'm always a bit wary of saying that because, you know, I was a, I was a geek at school. I was also autistic without knowing it. Um, I was a model. Um, and, you know, that, that essentially is the nuts and bolts of Geek Girl. But there's also a lot of fiction, you know, like, it's not like I'm just telling my life story. It's not my diary. So when people are like, you know, what was it like when you met Nick? And I'm like, Nick's not real. Like, <laughs> that's not real. Almost nobody in the book is real. It's fiction. I've written fiction, but I've based it on my experiences um, and, you know, the character that I was at 15. And then I've built fiction around it because I'm a storyteller and that's that's my that's my love. That's my passion. Um, so, yeah, it's always a bit upsetting for people when they're like, tell me what happened with Nick after. Did you marry him? And I'm like, it's not it's not autobiographical. It's not it's not my actual life story. Like, <laughs> I'm really sorry. <laughs> oh no, 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 it's just like one of those confusion things because when people yeah. look at it, they tend to think, is this what happened to the real author? But I think what readers are missing is that even though it's fictional, it's, it's something that you can use your imagination really. And uh, it could be like a connection to people's lives. And what I tend to read is that I imagine if I was the character and then I imagine all the people around me are, are based on the characters as well. And, yeah. um, and I know that few close friends that were really close. And um, I, I just thought, yeah, I know a few people who are Nat or I knew a few people were Alexa and I know a few people who were Nick as well. Well, and then a few with one of the Valentine sisters. Yeah, um, it, it just makes you think it's wonderful to actually get into the imagination a bit, and I think that's what people are missing. Yeah, I mean, it's 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 really complex. I mean, if, you know, in fairness to everybody else, it's very complex to be able to say these bits are true, these bits are not. But even the bits that aren't true. So, for instance, when you're writing, you know, maybe Harriet's on a shoot that I I, I invented a lot of photo shoots for her because obviously. Uh, I did not do all those photo shoots and I had to, uh, part of the joy of writing for me, I mean, it's, you know, I'm autistic, so I have special interests and my, uh, my life sort of key special interests, the thing that I have, that has driven me. Um, and it's not even just a passion. I always feel like passion is the wrong word because I can't live without it. Like I can't breathe without it. So, you know, writing and storytelling is my autistic life special interest um and i think that you know it's it's really tricky to explain that you know uh, you're taking seeds from your own life and you're planting them and you're watching them grow into flowers that don't really exist or never existed but are based on truth and you know even if i haven't been in the situation that harriet's been in i know exactly how i felt in that kind of situation or you know what i would do in that kind of situation how i would react um, you know, part of the joy of writing is that I get to be a million different jobs at once. So I think people sometimes forget that, you know, if you're writing, for instance, Geek Girl, I'm obviously an author and I'm Harriet. But I'm also, uh, I have to invent all the fashion shoots. I have to invent all the clothes that she wears. You know, I have, I get to be a designer. I get to be a set locating scout. You know, I get, I, I get to do every job that is done in those books. I get to do as well, which is part of the joy of it. Because I'm like, today I will be a fashion designer. And I'll be working out what Harriet is wearing on set. Um, so yeah, it's it's complex the way that you take life and you take imagination and you kind of weave them together. Um, that's what I love about it. Oh, that, that, that's just um, really, really nice just to have a look at. And then I always wondered that as well as being a writer, what was your favorite um, book when you are not writing Geek Girl or The Valentines? Uh, what, what's the book or the books you enjoy reading and why? Oh, I read, I read so many different things that I, you know, I, I find it very difficult to pick favourites on there either. But I, I have got a few that are very close to my heart. When I was younger, it was Anne of Green Gables. That was my uh, teen, like, I had, I didn't really have any friends um, at all when I was at school. And reading was the thing that kind of kept me sane and allowed me to deal with what essentially was trauma at school um, by escaping and taking a book with me and, you know, kind of pretending I wasn't there essentially. And Anna Green Gables was my, my kindred spirit and uh, kind of my soul fire. Um, and I, I loved her. She was like my genuine best friend um, to the point where now when people say they loved Anna Green Gables, I get really possessive and annoyed about it because <laughs> I almost feel like, that I love Anne and I'm like, you don't love Anne as much as I love Anne. Anne's my friend. Can you all back off please? Because I'm pretty sure I had her first. <laughs> but, <laughs> that's how much I love Anne is that I feel really, really resentful of anyone who also loves Anne. Um, 
So yeah, she was, you know, I mean, I think, I think personally that she is also on the spectrum. Um, I genuinely believe that. Um, but regardless, she was something I connected to. So Anne of Green Gables was probably the book that had the biggest impact, impact on me. I've never yeah. read the book before. So um, it's... Um... Well, that's good, because it means you're not going to try and take her off me. <laughs> no, I'm joking. You have to read it. <laughs> Read it. <laughs> <laughs> I, I know um I had like different stuff as well because um I I've always been like in the little historical books really ah me too I love those like Tudor period I'm massively fascinated in yeah Tudor's is my favorite period as well yeah. like it's one of my special interest Tudor I love it yeah um, Although it's absolutely amazing because um, you get to have an attachment to each of the different wives, really. And um, it, it's like really amazing. But then also um, I, I got a little bit jealous because I always used to read the Tarzan books and I always get uh, used to be jealous of um, uh, Jane having Tarzan. And like, no, he's <laughs> fine. <laughs> Which is your favourite Tudor wife then? Like, what, what's your, what are your feelings about those? Because I have strong personal feelings about each of them as well. <laughs> oh, that's a trick question. I know that um, I've been to visit all of the six wives' graves when I was little because uh, it was like going on a Tudor mystery tour. I need to do that. I need to do it. <laughs> oh, it's, it's definitely worth it. And, uh, oh, goodness, who's my favourite? I know I've got two, and I really want to write a book about one one day, if I ever got the chance, but I know that it was, I think it's either Catherine Howard or Anne Boleyn. Mm, yeah. I mean, have you read the Alice and Weir books? The uh, Alice and Weir Boleyn, um, Howard, um, Tudor books? Oh, yes. Um, Wolf Hall? No, 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 that's Hilary Mantel. And um, the, the Alison Weir is like, she does kind of historical fiction that is more, that she's got one each on each of the wives. I think she hasn't got quite to, she hasn't got to the end of the series yet, but yeah, it's kind of big chunky historical books about each of the wives, but like through the lens of fiction, essentially. Um, definitely check that. Yeah, I got you. Can, I got you now, because um, I'm currently reading Catherine Howard, the latest one. Yes, yeah. No, they're really good. I mean, I have I have strong feelings on all of them. I mean, Anne Boleyn is my favourite just because she was a woman out of her own time, essentially. Um, oh. But, you know, and, I, and, I, and I, I'm, yeah, I've never been a big fan of Jane Seymour. I've always thought she was a bit more. Um, but yeah, Anne Boleyn, every oh. day. Not oh yes, Anne Boleyn is, is like, she's like the w wife who changed everything. But I know if she, if she lived in the 21st century, and um, she, she would have been fully accepted then, really. She would be um, a best friend as well. <laughs> yeah she's I mean she's fierce and she's feminist and she's you know um I, I just think that she's fascinating and, and tragically murdered by what I personally believe is the most famous sociopath of all time um Henry VIII <laughs> like absolute narcissistic personality disorder through and through um but yeah I think it's yeah it's an amazing period of history so um yeah totally. <laughs> oh yeah definitely and then um I'm speaking of like um, oh I read onto the other books um because you mentioned um oh let me start again uh, <laughs> get yeah, off from track yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we tend to bounce it's one of those things where when like you know when people talk they just, we, we bounce I can I can keep up it's fine just bounce away <laughs> <laughs> so um you mentioned as well because um I had to read a little bit of the article in the Times newspaper about your autism and mm. uh, I know that uh, you um were diagnosed when you were eight months as you mentioned earlier but um how did your recently new diagnosis help you under in understanding within yourself I was diagnosed at 39, yeah, so eight months ago, um, so at 39, so it's been a new, a brand new uh, journey, and, um, you know, it's been, it's one I'm still on, to be honest, like, it's it's literally looking at yourself um, and your life through a different lens, and going, you know, moments of like, oh, things are starting to, literally everything snaps into place, it's like, you know, suddenly you've been looking through the world at glasses that have just got cling film across them, and take it off, and you're like, I can see everything suddenly is very clear, um, which, you know, is amazing. And it comes with, um, but it comes with complex emotions. So, you know, there's a lot of grief, there's anger, you know, how did I get to 39 and, and no one picked up on it? Um, you know, there's, there's, 
an identity crisis because you're like who am I like who you know even from from a good and bad perspective because you know essentially I had I had a little wobble after I had a lot of wobbles a lot of wobbles. I cried a lot like it's a massive it's a massive life-changing kind of realization but like one of the wobbles I had was that you know a lot of my positive qualities that I have always kind of I'm very hard on myself generally I'm, I'm you know psychologist when I was diagnosed was like you know on a personal note after we'd done the diagnosis she was on a personal note you know you're extraordinary and and all this kind of thing but um you have a problem with self-esteem which makes sense because you've spent four decades being ripped apart by people um and it's something I'm still struggling with and and, you know I can be very hard on myself and use very unkind words about myself um so some of the things that I have always kind of held on to is my best qualities like you know my honesty or my kindness or my loyalty um you know post-diagnosis I'm like wait so if they're kind of famously autistic qualities is that even me? Like, you know, if I if I find like, you know, dishonesty like physically uncomfortable and painful, like can I even take the credit for being honest if I'm just doing what I am wired to do? Like how much of it is me and how where am I and where is you know and it's it's a long process of kind of realizing that you are one and the same and actually you know you are a fully fleshed out dimensional creature that is that is you know complex essentially but there was that moment if that does that make any sense where you suddenly realize all the good things about you you're like oh did I am I even responsible for those you know can I take credit so yeah it's been a does that make sense it, it's just been a very up and down process oh no it definitely makes sense really I mean um in a way really because I was quite opposite because I was diagnosed early but I never found I was autistic until I was 10 and uh-huh. um but I was never really interested when I found out as well. It's like, yeah, whatever. But then when I got to the teenage stage, really, I, I just felt like something's odd about me. And um, and I'd, I'd always used to look at like school papers at school whenever um, the learning support department would have meetings about me. And when I looked at them, I just thought, is this just me on a piece of paper? Is yeah. that all I am? Yeah, I'm fascinated by the difference actually between early diagnosis and late diagnosis because obviously, you know, there's there's pros and cons to both. And and you know, when you're early diagnosed, like like you were, for instance, you know, you you live with that knowledge all the time, and then you're constantly being assessed and judged by the people around you with that diagnosis in mind. Whereas when you're late diagnosed, you have no idea, and so the you know the assessment and the judgment is slightly different. Everyone's like, what's wrong with that? You know. <laughs> um, but you know, it's it's a fascinating, fascinating difference. But yeah, it's you look at the piece of paper, and when I got my um, clinical diagnosis, because I wanted to make sure, because I, I kind of knew as soon as I uh, self-diagnosed, essentially, I was like, I know this is me. I know in my heart this is me because I literally connect to everything that I've read or seen now. Um, but I was like, I need a, a diagnosis because I a don't trust myself. B, if I want to speak about it, I want to know that I am actually speaking from a perspective of you know of, of real or you know. Uh, not saying that something is real but I would like to know that um there's going to be doubters and I want to be able to say no definitely um but like you know it's um I totally lost my train of thought there I got all freaked out by like saying the wrong thing and then I've lost my chain of thought but yeah it's it's uh no I've gone I've gone oh. Wait, wait, wait. <laughs> oh, oh well, never mind. I, I think it, it does make sense really in, in in a way of like there's a connection and then I always tend to think with autism, it's a lost connection. Like if you imagine it as like, um, it's a mobile phone. And if you don't know or not sure, you tend to lose the Wi-Fi or the phone signal. Mm-hmm. Mm, yeah, there is, yeah, totally. It's a really good way of putting it. It is a, you know, it's, it's like we're on a different wavelength. And, you know, someone else described it um, on Twitter the other day as, as, you know, you're you're on a different wavelength. When you're communicating with people who are also autistic, it's a lot simpler. There's a lot less noise. Um, whereas, you know, when you're talking to someone who maybe isn't, it, it, it can be uh, like two wavelengths just going like that. And you're both like, what? Uh, what's going on? What this? What? It, it, you know. Um, oh, back to what we were saying about being on paper and you know when you say when you look at the paper and you're feeling like you know is that is that me that you know on and same way with the psychologist you know she was amazing and she was so lovely on 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 the in the meeting and you know with the diagnosis and stuff but when I got my official report through you know my certificate or whatever and like with the official long clinical report it was all deficit 
So it was all, it was, you know, it was, she can't do this. She can't do that. She is incapable of this. She is, you know, and I cried because you get this report through that's like, you're reading this paper going, wow, is that how I'm now seen as someone who is unable to dot, 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 incapable of dot, 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 rather than, it's almost none of it was positive. None of it was. It wasn't mm. like, but she can dot, dot, dot. It's all just like, what is wrong and broken about her, which is just really distressing. So I know what you mean. You look at the paper and you go, is that what I am now? I'm just a, quote, disorder. Like, get rid of the word disorder. Different, divergent does not mean disorder. So, yeah. Well, it, it, it's definitely like one of those things because everyone's debating on social media at the moment saying, is it a disorder or is it a condition? And uh, I know I've touched on this before, but um, it, it's always like, I can see why the word disorder is very negative. And I never really realized it until a few months ago. And you just think, ah, that just makes sense in general. Yeah, I mean, why are we using the? I mean, I understand why. But the problem is the language around autism has been, you know, it's historically just embedded with awful, awful history. Like, you know, it is, you know, there's 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 Nazism attached to it. There's, you know, there's 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 death attached. There's murder attached to it. Like, you know, that it, it was just generally seen as these people who were broken. And what do we do with them? Can we assimilate them back into society, or do we have to kill them? Like, it is, uh, you know, it is. The more I read about it, the more like icky it is and essentially autism spectrum disorder has come from that 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 thinking which is here's here's a normal person and here's what they do and here's how they act and here's how they think and here's how they react to the environment around them um here are these people who don't so they are disordered they are other they are lesser so now what do we do with these people instead of uh okay so there appear to be more than one way of being wired there's more than one kind of brain um and actually this is your normal but this is also just divergent it's not lesser or broken it's just different um and i personally would love to see the word disorder taken out of um autism spectrum disorder and changed to divergence you know keep all the literature the same it's still asd but it's not disordered it's divergence um Oh, oh yeah I definitely agree really and um, <laughs> it's kind of like looking back on like the things uh, like the things that you can't do really I know that uh, personally for me um, before I went to like drama school a lot of people and I never knew this until years later many of the people which especially the teachers at school they thought I would never do university never live independently uh, never be in a relationship or anything like that and but smack ban there you go I, 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 there are some things that I did do and I eventually got a degree and then I eventually um um did have a job but not paid job really just volunteer and then I'm in a relationship it, it's just amazing what people can achieve really and people just think you can't do this this but you can always prove them wrong yeah, and you know the limitations. Why are they putting limitations on on you know? I think it's because you know perhaps we're not we're, we're not completely understood, and I mean by that by not just the public, but by potentially science is still working us out. You know, it's still trying to make sense of it. Um, and I do think that um, you know putting limitations on what we're capable of or what we should be or what we shouldn't like. You know, there are things that we can do. There are things that our brains can do that that normal brains cannot do and and are un completely incapable of but we don't call them like you know ah oh, it's such a shame that your memory is so awful or you know it's such a shame that you are you know unable to feel other people's emotions like in your actual body um or you know in my case it's so sad that you can't write 11 novels by the age of 40 like i you know we don't go around accusing neuronormative people of being um you know disordered because they can't do the things that we can do for instance but it, it they immediately put limitations on us based on on their criteria of what it is to be a successful human so yeah I mean ah to it you know we do what we are we're individuals and we'll be capable of what we're capable of Oh yeah, definitely. I couldn't agree more. But then uh, jumping into like um, more uh, books and all of that, this is something that 
I've always wanted to ask this question because as well as having autism, I have a language difficulty and a learning disability mm -hmm. as well. And um, I always tend to think the language difficulty and the learning disability is a massive problem for reading as well. Because even though people with autism, well, autistic people find it a little bit hard. Imagine if you have um, either a language difficulty or a learning disability or both, it could be twice or triple as hard. And uh, I always want to know that, especially during the summer reading, challenge how do you think schools and libraries should support readers who have learning or language difficulties to encourage them to read Whew, that's a big question um okay this is off the top of my head and something I, I need to think about more i think but i think off the top of my head i think one of the really important things is that it should be encouraged by love of reading so you know don't push books on people that they don't want to read or they're not interested in don't um force books on a, a level for instance you know like okay well that book is too young for you or that book is too old for you um you know like books have you know they find their right readers and you know there's nothing wrong with someone picking up a book that is you know potentially for or written about or for a demographic that it might be younger because you're still getting a story you're still getting the imagination that comes with it you're still getting a love and actually perhaps taking away that boundary um, that barrier to to a love of reading um, might be one way to encourage, for instance, people that maybe struggle a little bit more to to enjoy it rather than feeling like they're being tested or or, or that it's difficult. Um, you know, so give someone a freaking picture book if they want to read it. You know, it doesn't matter what age they are. Um, I mean, on the flip side, I'm I'm hyperlexic, so that's um, something that I am. You know, it's kind of the opposite. Um, but I struggled as well because they would be like, "You can't read that book; it's too old for you." And I'm like, "I." read it and I need that oh um so you know stop limiting and you know prescribing books according to age growth and ability that's that's one of the things I would say um also you know with people that are struggling so one of my best friends is dyslexic and the people that are you know potentially struggling they might just need more time you know they might they can't maybe do it as fast and you know it's maybe giving them longer if if they you know it's like a book a week or whatever give them two weeks give them a month like it doesn't matter what speed they're going at just let them enjoy the story um you know and you know perhaps i don't i don't know how it works particularly you know do they have to fill out forms about the book or you know anything like that well, this is like like a thing, really, because um, during the summer reading challenge that I've done, um, what they have to do is that um, they have to go away with six books and they have to um, read. Uh, sometimes their parents will encourage them to do on the reading level and schools will do the same. But sometimes they will pick their own books, really, and um, they'll have to get them to read as much as they can to complete the challenge by September. And uh, they have to talk about um, with, the, um, uh, with the answers that the volunteers would ask them questions, like I said before. And mm -hmm. it's really interesting to see um, each like child would really love to like put like have some books in front of their hands. And then I knew some uh, oh, I, I knew like seven year olds who um, actually wanted to read some picture books or if there was um, a, a, like a nine year old who wanted to read a book um, focusing on Roald Dahl or Jacqueline Wilson. And then also the youngest member who got volunteered was 18 months and um, her mum and dad were like already just like reading her a picture book about um the bear hunt and the hungry caterpillar and um it's absolutely amazing to see that children can have like reading in their free time however um when they become older and this is like also something that um i could personally relate to because um, even though i had a specialist department in my school it was mainstream but i was always encouraged to read big books to read for my GCSE exams in English and mm. one of them even though it was really long and I, I struggled with it but I enjoyed it was Jane Eyre and yeah. um, it, it, it was kind of Jane Eyre <laughs> <laughs> but it, it was <laughs> yeah, it, it was really interesting really to see um how uh, how I, I actually found things a little bit difficult. Mice and men as well. That was uh, another tricky one, especially mm -hmm. with the discrimination of one of the main characters as mm -hmm. being like dumb and all of that. But considering mm -hmm. it was written in the 1930s, it, mm -hmm. it, it, it was like a really different time. And um, I struggled to read with that and uh, personally relate to that. So what my parents did when I struggled is that as well as me reading the book, they would buy a DV copy of a DVD 
um, of a fi- of the film of based on the book adaptation, and I can always like watch it on repeat uh, to make me feel comfortable with either reading the book a bit more or understand the story plot for uh, in time for my examinations, my final okay. exams. And that's another really great way of doing it. You know, that I'm, I have no snobbery whatsoever about films, TV, or that kind of thing. I mean, as far as I'm concerned, like my passion is stories and you can get them anywhere. And if, if sometimes people maybe struggle with books to visualize, you know, they can't, they can't visualize, we're not all built the same. And sometimes, you know, they really don't see the images or the, you know, the, the setting or, you know, and, and actually a film and TV like can really help you kind of, then if you want to read the book, you see it more clearly, you know, you see the people and the characters and where they are and um, and I think that's a really great way of like lowering that that um that that barrier to 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 loving stories and books without trying to be like oh well if it's not the book it doesn't matter um which I'm just not I'm not into at all like it is crazy I just think it needs to be about love of books and and also you know it, it what I find frustrating sometimes with these kind of challenges is often the emphasis is put on quantity so often it's like how many books can you read or do you need to ha- you know can you read 100 or can you read 200 books I mean I get people saying I've read 300 books this year and I'm like okay right I would personally rather read slower and and really love a book like I would rather read a book two or three times so that I I know exactly like everything about it than just chomp through them and go um, 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 and then get to the end and go oh, I can't remember any of them now like what, what they're all blended into one I have no idea like I think quantity is often a it's just a bizarre way of looking at literature, you know. I don't think medals should be given for being able to read, you know, lots and lots of books all at once. Um, and actually, there should be more focus on: Do you really love that book? Are you taking your time to really enjoy it? Are you, you know, are you feeling pressured? Are you, you know, you visualizing it, watching the TV? You know, I think that there needs to be a bit less emphasis on how many and a lot more emphasis on how much you love it <laughs> um I know that um with the previous year with the lockdown as well a lot of children and teenagers they would find it very hard uh, to catch up with the reading because since because of the last year lockdown their reading skills have I, I can imagine dropped um, mm-hmm. just because that they haven't got time uh, to actually help encourage them to read in the classroom and all of that and then there have always been some creative problems as well but did you always find that any creative problems that helped or hindered you during the last year in lockdown? I mean, I think what's really interesting about lockdown is that there seems to be this idea that if you've got lots of time in your hands and you're at home, you're not going anywhere. That's a really great time to, for instance, read a lot of books or write a lot of books. And, um, you know, I had a lot of friends being like, oh, you must be in your element. You know, you, you're at home all the time and you've got all this like time in your hands to write things and you know you should get three four novels done this year and I'm like there's a global pandemic going on like you know we're not robots we can't just be like oh never mind won't think about that I'll just get real productive and read lots and write lots like we've got lots of um you know there's a lot of emotion attached to that and you know I think that with kids especially with the reading elements of it like you know when you're stuck at home and you're bored and you haven't seen your friends and you're stressed about you know missing school or not missing school or you've got your sisters and brothers being in pain the entire day and you know you're going stir fried crazy which we all have done over the last year and a half like the last thing you really want to do is pick up a book. I mean, sometimes you want to, but maybe that's not where you're at in your head. And actually, you're not getting as much solace or fun from it. You're actually not feeling, you know, it's not satisfying. Um, and similarly with writing, you know, I, I found it very hard to write over the last year and a half. Um, didn't even read much, to be honest. I was just so sad a lot of the time. And a lot, I live alone. So I was alone for almost all the time. And, you know, reading wasn't the thing I was necessarily inclined to do. I was like, I'm already separated from the real world by one step. I don't necessarily want to take another step into yet further away from the real world. <laughs> like, um, So, yeah, I struggled to read and write. I watched a lot of television because I just, you know, reached a point where I was like, I can just sit on a sofa and, and stare <laughs> for like 11 hours a day. But, yeah, I think that kind of like, you know, it... it the, the idea that time and privacy and quiet is in, conducive to reading and writing isn't is is much more complex than that 
Um, and, you know, of course, kids are struggling to read when they haven't been out to the park and they haven't seen their mates and they haven't had a proper chat in person. Like, of course, they don't want to read a book. Um, so, you know, I'm hoping that now that the world opens up a little bit, that will they'll feel a bit maybe more inclined. But who knows? Oh yeah, well we'll definitely keep our fingers crossed for that this one really because uh, I know that um as well as um me having nephews and a niece of my own and um also being um a girl guide lead uh for my local brownie troop I- I've heard so many of the girls actually um saying how much they miss their friends but not a single one of them actually suggested about books even though one of the challenges um they always give in the group just to um go away and go home and then as part of an activity to give them one of their badges just to read a story I've heard none of them actually uh reading like a story and I even tried to get some to do the reading challenge a few times but it wasn't like successful and it, it really got me thinking have has reading actually changed in like the present generation in a number of years really and would it change again really I think it has and it will like you know things shift and the reality is that when I was a kid uh books were pretty much the only source of entertainment that you could do on your own and I was on my own a lot so you know other than the fact that I just generally love stories you know that was one of the things I turned to but now you know there's Netflix and there's there's you know a, a billion different streaming services um a billion different shows so you've already got the storytelling kind of like almost ticked which means that you know you're not necessarily being drawn towards books um you know especially with the pandemic as I said like you know the the urge to escape the real world maybe isn't there when you're already so far away from the real world (laughs) um and I and I do feel like it's you know it's shifting but you can come back to it I mean I think I've met a lot of young people who stop reading between the ages of like 10 and 20 um and then fall in love with it again as they get older um but you know it's it's just trying to kind of encourage that love of fun rather than um you know feeling like it's homework or that it's something that has to be forced um which you know like I'm a big proponent I'm just I'm I'm a big advocate of read what you love uh, of anything and I don't care if it's you know if it's a dictionary read it if it's a historical romance read it like there should be no snobbery about books and stories there should be no age limitations there should just be if you love it read it um and I think that's the way to really get people reading Oh, yeah, I definitely couldn't agree more. But then we're going on to one final question, because this is a big one. And, <laughs> yeah, I, I, and this is a question I'm very curious to know. And I, I, I'm the person that don't, doesn't want to be a nosy Parker. But is there any more books in the works at the moment? Um, so I'm having a bit of a, a weird time at the moment, obviously, because, uh, you know, pandemic happened, which was weird. Um, the Valentine's was my uh, last book that I've written, which came out a few months ago. Um, and with the pandemic and everything, I've it felt like a natural break for me to kind of stop and go, what am I doing next? What do I want? Um, plus, with the autism diagnosis, I've been, you know, very emotionally up in the air um, on like a really personal level um so it's been a really good time to, for me to go what do I want now what am I you know where am I drawn um and I'm working on lots of different projects you know ideas for different books um for tv for you know film so I'm just kind of uh exploring at the moment after a decade of being under contract essentially I'm now uh, free for the first time so I'm seeing what I want to do Oh, that's fantastic, because um, I was talking with my parents the other day, and um, my dad mentioned that if um, if there was a chance that if Geek Girl might make it to Hollywood or the Valentines as well. Yeah, I mean, it's it's frustrating because um, I get asked it a lot, and it's, it's tricky because, you know, the, Geek Girl has been optioned pretty much constantly since it came out. Like, it has been, you know, with various companies... <laughs> Um, and you know for whatever reason it falls through at the last minute because you know a company got bought or someone got fired or whatever it was you know like it it has has limboed basically for a decade um and we are currently working on something now um I have written the pilot so I will be if it goes ahead I will be the writer of it um which is what I wanted because I love writing um but yeah, we're, it's still it's still in negotiation. So yes, 
ideally it will it's one of my like bucket list like dreams um but it's so complicated in, in film and tv industry it's not like books books you write them you're like do you want to publish it yes or no um with film and tv they're like oh we've got the right money coming in and we've got this and what about that part? you know like it's all so technical so um hopefully in short yes it will but I'm working on it <laughs> oh uh, hopefully fingers crossed it will actually because yeah. I'm definitely looking forward to the day when it comes out really and um yeah. oh yeah it would just be so fantastic to watch and, and everything especially um me after reading it for the first time actually but um hopefully like whatever happens really it will all be a success and we're probably going to have to leave it there for the interview yeah. Holly thank you so much for coming on thank today you for having me. it was awesome I'm so sorry I talked over you I'm really bad especially on zoom of working out when to talk and when not to <laughs> oh, no, no. to be honest though I do the same thing sometimes so I, I get where you're coming from really yeah. <laughs> thanks for being an amazing interview really enjoyed oh, it oh you're welcome and it was always a pleasure to have you and uh, i oh. wish you the very best of luck for everything you do really with the books and the uh, like the films and the scripts as well and the tv series and then all the projects you've been working on oh. and until then everybody i will see you next month for another podcast video take care of yourselves bye, bye.